All right, man. My bad. Um, shit, Grand Rising, everybody. So we got a new one, right? Um, this is a little different. Um, as y'all can see by the title, um, we got the Outlaw. You feel me in Detroit? Let's see what this be about. Club, bro. Man, I got nothing to say about doing like the Outlaw Club, bro. We gonna do what we gonna do, cause we we some outlaws. In the early morning hours of October 4th, 2013, a task force led by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives gathered outside of a small brick house on Edinburgh Road. Their target was a man named Marvin Nicholson, a lifelong Detroit resident who worked as a bartender, but was also involved in an escalating conflict involving groups of outlaw motorcycle clubs throughout the Midwest. The agents loudly announced their presence then tossed a flashbang grenade into the home and used a battering ram to bust down the door. As they were charging in to make arrests, the agents heard four loud pops coming from a bedroom. They pressed on and arrested a mostly nude Nicholson, but later discovered four fresh bullets. If the fact that this thing got his beard braided, bro. <laughs> that's, some shit, that's some shit right there that were stopped by a door frame near Nicholson's room. While he would later claim that he believed that he was being targeted by robbers, not cops, Nicholson had grabbed one of three guns found inside the residence and fired in the direction of federal agents. It turned out that the raid on Nicholson's home was one of a series of ATF-led raids around Michigan that day, all with one purpose in mind, to take down the Phantom Motorcycle Club a self-described group of outlaw riders who organized underground parties, interstate motorcycle runs, and held themselves up as the toughest MC among the handful that existed in Detroit and the surrounding oh, no, no, no. up as the toughest MC parties, interstate motorcycle runs, and held themselves up as the toughest okay. MC among the handful that existed in Detroit and the surrounding communities. While the Phantoms would later insist that they were nothing more than a group of like-minded barroom brawlers who formed friendships over their mutual love of the open road, the ATF had other ideas. They believed that by serving search warrants on Phantoms members on October 4th, 2013, they had prevented one of the biggest biker gang massacres in United States history. But first, let's back up a bit. The Phantoms Motorcycle Club was formed in Chicago in the late 1960s, riding a nationwide wave of hundreds of motorcycle club formations that started in the early to mid 20th century. Of motorcycle club formations. started in the early to mid 20th century. The phenomenon was created by a mix of pop culture, government policy, and an American tendency to idealize free spirits and free thinkers. In the post-World War II era, the United States government had a surplus of ground-moving equipment and would let motorcycles go for free or cheap, making them easily available to returning combat veterans seeking to fill a void. Bring similar tabs together. At the time, the image of the individualist, rugged biker traveling the continent was quickly replacing the cowboy as the latest cultural symbol of Western freedom. Ironically, the American Motorcyclist Association, hoping to combat the stigma associated with so-called outlaw bikers, publicly commented in the late 1940s that 99% of motorcycle clubs were law-abiding and upstanding citizens. Outlaw motorcycle clubs seized on this and have been proudly referring to themselves as one percenters ever since. The most successful one percenter clubs, like the Hells Angels, the Mongols, and the Outlaws, have formed massive organizations propped up by the Mongols and the Outlaws. I just wanted to make sure I heard that right. But those are the only two gangs that I ever heard. The Hell Angel and the Mongols, bro. 
I don't really know too much about the bike uh, game. To be honest with you, in my opinion, I feel like they, um, I'm going to just say the word glorified, but I feel like, you know, uh, they're, uh, well, in my opinion, I feel like Blood and Crips, GD, Vice Lords, um, SM, SM13, or if I said that wrong, my bad. Uh, all that and above, right? I feel like those were more glorified than the bike, um, the bike gangs. Laws have formed massive organizations propped up by support clubs who both dominate their regions and bat off wannabe members with a stick, sometimes literally. The less successful ones live in their shadow, professing the same exclusivity as the big clubs while walking the tightrope between needing to beef up their membership without sacrificing quality. That brings us to the city of Detroit, which in the 2010s was home to outlaw motorcycle clubs like the Phantoms, Hell Lovers, Satan Sidekicks, and the Sin City Disciples. These groups maintained violent rivalries and tenuous peace treaties with one another as they attempted to coexist in a relatively small community. The Phantoms had an estimated 400 to 500 members nationwide, and while the Detroit chapter boasted 50 to 70 members, other chapters were struggling to make ends meet. A clubhouse, based in nearby Pontiac, for instance, only had four members during this time, giving little to no meaning to those who held titles like president and vice president of the chapter. The Phantoms differed from typical outlaw clubs in some key ways. They didn't strictly require members to use American model motorcycles like Harley Davidson's. Japanese models, commonly referred to as crotch rockets, were allowed. And the Phantoms were an ethnically diverse club. Like most outlaw motorcycle clubs, non-members were considered civilians and therefore lessers. Women who dated or married Phantoms were considered property. And while members included cocaine dealers, firearm stockpilers, scammers, and- I can only imagine you try to talk to one of they girl and they go inside your head. You don't even know. And then I feel like the female bikers are, are, are I'm not going to say more, but they feel, I feel like with female bikers, bro, they probably tend to like, um, start certain shit just because they know who their husband is or boyfriend, but I'm assuming more, more of a husband, like. By that, I mean, like, if a female married to a, to a hell angel or whatever the case is, bro, you know for a fact she might get slick out the mouth just due to, due to the fact who her husband is, you feel me? Or what she's associated with. I feel like when you put a female in a game that give them to them, they feel like they have more power on, on they can get away with shit. Thieves, they were really the minority. Most of the club's members held blue-collar jobs. They were landscapers, window installers, plumbers, bartenders, and construction workers. With All right, see, I was about to say, oh, wait, wait, who did he say that does that shit? Hold on. Dealers, firearms, stockpilers, scammers, scammers. Okay. Women who dated or married phantoms were considered property. Uh -huh. And while members included cocaine dealers, firearms, stockpilers, scammers, and thieves, they were really the minority. Most of the club's members held blue collar jobs. They were landscapers, window installers, plumbers, bartenders, and construction workers with wives and children. But they were far from weekend warriors and lived up to the creed that when push came to shove, loyalty to the club had to come first. As with any club, its main symbol was a patch. Can you imagine you just getting into it one of uh, with a biker gang, right? You don't even know he's a biker gang, cause <laughs> nigga doing the the nigga had the same nine to five job as you, right? Y'all get into it or whatever the case is, and that and he's like, oh, just wait until I clock out, bro. Like, like you must not know, like, like, like he just like just going out, like, my bad. 
he just barking at you, just barking and barking. You feel me, like, bro? You just don't know. You just don't know. Just, just wait until my shift over. You think, nigga? You think this? this you think this is the only thing I do? Da, 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 da. Like, bro, can you, like, I'm just saying, bro. Imagine, imagine having a nine to five with affiliate. You don't even know he's affiliated, and then that nigga <laughs> wait when we go outside to the parking lot. Sewn into a leather vest that delineated the club, region, and oftentimes rank of the member. In this case, their symbol included literal scythe wielding phantoms and a tombstone to represent fallen members. Though commonly known by the slang term rag, these vests are the pride of any motorcycle club, and members are instructed to treat them like their own skin. When Phantom members stole rags from rival clubs, they would hang them upside down inside their clubhouse on what was known as the dead wall, an ultimate sign of disrespect. When one member of the Phantom's rags were stolen by his own girlfriend, their national president gave him an ultimatum. Either get your rags back or get hospitalized trying to get them back. Get it back or get or die trying getting it back. The bad news: the perfect workflow doesn't exist. Like ain't, the good like, news, ain't no between. You ain't no choice. Like, Let me show you how I use Monday. When it came to conflicts with other biker clubs in the area, the Phantoms had a big leg up. They were tied in with one of the most powerful and populous gangs in the Midwest, the Vice Lords. In fact, the Phantoms' national leader was a man named Antonio Johnson, who went by Mr. Tony and Big Bro and held the rank of three-star general in the Vice Lords, the highest rank in the entire state of Michigan. Mr. Tony was a charismatic, outgoing man whose underground ties were well known in Detroit, something that would come in handy for the club throughout 2013, when violent conflicts seemed to dog the Phantoms at every turn. 13. Hold on, I want to see something real quick. when violent conflicts seemed to dog the Phantoms at every turn. There were plenty of colorful characters in this group. Aside from Mr. Tony was his right-hand man, Marvin Nicholson, who went by Chosen One, and another close friend named Stephen Shoeboots Caldwell, a man who held presidential rank in the Phantoms, but was also a very well-liked and respected member, and who also had ties to the Vice Lords. Then there was Carl Fats Miller, the Detroit chapter president in 2013, who had one of the most important roles in the club. Miller was an expert motorcycle thief who bragged he could steal a bike in under a minute. Along with fellow phantom Maurice Moe Williams, Miller possessed Harley Davidson master keys, which they used to rip off hundreds of bikes. When the master key wasn't available, he would just find a van or a trailer, roll the motorcycle into it, and take off. He even stole one from his own neighbor, a member of the Vigilante Motorcycle Club, who bragged to Miller about how he could leave his bike in his driveway without problems because people in Detroit were wary of the Vigilantes. That's the, that's the just come and try me, you feel me? That, that That's all it is, bro. Like... The the main people that feel like the main people that feel like they can't get got get got. You feel me? Like you go to brag, man, they know who I'm affiliated with, but they know not to play with my shit, boy. You know they, they know they touch this thing. I'm on them. You mean this and the third? Woo, 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 woo. Get about a week or two, bro. All that shit you were saying. But Miller's sticky fingers caught up with him in May 2013 in Macomb County, Michigan when he and a phantom named Brian P.C. Sorrell were arrested for using a van to steal a motorcycle from an apartment complex. And when police found a gun in P.C.'s van, Miller was charged with possessing it. Miller was angry that he was being blamed for P.C.'s gun, and it was just the latest time he felt slighted. Less than a year earlier, in June 2012, he'd been ordered to retrieve the vest of a dropout phantom member named Dirty Red. Miller had tried to obey the order, but was set up, shot in the stomach, and ended up in a coma at the hospital for over a month. Sheesh. Miller was bothered that no one retaliated against Dirty Red, even more so. How do you say we gang gang? 
if this the code and morals we live by, right? How you feel we gang gang or whatever the case is? I go on a mission. Well, we're just gonna call it. I go on a dummy mission. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna say. We, uh, you go on a dummy mission and you 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 play stupid game, win stupid prizes, in a hospital for like a month, for like three months they said or some shit, right? In the midst of that, like I said, <laughs> we gotta live, we 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 gotta go by their code, their rules, right? <laughs> the whole time that you've been laying down in a damn coma, ain't nobody did shit for you. And I don't mean like, you know, like, I'm not going to say like financial wise or anything like that. I just mean by like, you know, we always have not we, but certain people always want to sit here and be like, oh, you ain't going to slide for your uh, brother. Uh, you ain't going to slide for your brother. You ain't da da da. You feel me? You ain't ride or die. How you show your love, your loyalty? Like you showed your loyalty to the game by doing, you know, crash out missions and all that shit. Shit happened to you. And no one does nothing for you. No one going and retaliated. So that once he'd been shot, the issue of retrieving one in a coma at Listen. the hospital for over a month. Miller was bothered that no one retaliated against Dirty no Red. No one. Even more so that once he'd been shot, the issue of retrieving the vest seemed to dissipate and no one else had even tried to get them back. Now, with the... Th so that's saying, like, we want you to go do something stupid, Right. That involved the gang Like oh no we live by this So you gotta go and get their vest This and the third You try to go get their vest You get popped And after you get popped No one actually does shit No one does anything to re uh, To slide for you boy You feel me I I'm sorry right I'm still like half asleep bro And the blood don't make it no better. But what I'm trying to say is Like y'all y'all Listen if y'all If y'all still watching Y'all get what I'm trying to say right like you're part of this organization, affiliated by whatever you're affiliated by, whatever you know how this shit goes, bro. You touch one of mine, that like you touch one of mine, we come in, we come in ten deep for yours. You feel me? But no one did that. Threat of prison time looming. Miller offered to negotiate his way out of the situation by becoming a government snitch. Oh my god! Oh my god! And then we jump to the 6 9 error. At that very moment, an ATF special agent named Jared Marsh was working to build a case against the Phantoms and badly needed an insider. And he got Miller one. agreed to secretly record his friends committing crimes, and he got right to it. Uh, OTF jam, huh? The boy don't put the boy don't boy that jam got with, this, it with that lamp. This agreement, Marsh had stumbled onto a bit of luck that is rare in the world of outlaw motorcycle clubs, which pride themselves on vetting members so as to prevent exactly these types of betrayals and infiltration. One. Hey, hold on, real quick. I'm exactly sorry. I just had. I just. Outlaw motors. This, this just popped up in my head, and I just had to go back and say something. Right there. With this agreement, Marsh had stumbled onto a bit of luck that is rare in the world of outlaw motorcycle clubs. The camera right there. Oh, hold on. Yeah, I can't see it real quick. Hold on. Let me just do this real quick. All right. Y'all see the, the camera right here, right? You got a camera right there. That's one. Put that back right there. And then if you look in the back, I think it's a lot of flip phones or whatever the case is. That was the time where whenever you went out to a function, whatever the case was, bro, you had to take a picture and wait and wait for a good day that you were free to go to Walgreens or whatever the case is to print them pictures out, bro. You feel me? Like, <laughs> bro, can y'all, can some of y'all imagine now, bro, just how back then, like, like we used to really go out places like this, take pictures, and then post it once we get home, or whenever we get next to a computer or some shit. Right, right. Like you know, you put the caption. Oh, uh, you put the date, the time. Maybe some people put the date and the time and and all that shit. And um, the thing about how time changed. Like now, you can go to somewhere. And you can record it at that very moment. You can take a picture at that very moment and post it and let everybody know where you at. What you doing? which pride themselves on vetting members so as to prevent exactly these types of betrayals and infiltration. One notable example of the difficulties federal authorities have came around the same time as these events in Denver, Colorado, where the FBI was attempting to break into the Hell's Lovers Motorcycle Club with an undercover agent. 
the agent thought he was making some headway into the investigation when he was angrily approached at a Hell's Lover's party. One member accused him of being a fed, point blank, and gave him three options to prove otherwise. Ingest cocaine, smoke marijuana, or perform a sex act on a prostitute at the party. Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Bye. 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 That brings all right. I don't know too much about you know certain laws, so are you telling me because they said that you know they felt like he was an informant? So, does that mean if you're working with the feds or whatever the case is, you're not allowed to take part, you're not allowed to partake in any substance? Like, I, I, I don't know, so I'm acting. So, if you guys are still watching, let me know. You feel me? Like, if you're working with them, are you not allowed to be under well? I mean, well, I don't know. Be do I'm asking you guys because I would assume, I would assume, <laughs> I would assume just because you work with them, right, and you used to be affiliated, whatever, what, whatever that you're going against, you got to, you got to still stay in character. You got to seem like you're not, like, nothing is out of the ordinary. So that means if they ride, you ride, they smoke, you smoke, you feel me? Like, Y'all let me know down in, down in the comment below. Brings us to the late summer of 2013, when tensions between the Satan sidekicks and the Phantoms were reaching a boiling point. The sidekicks made things even worse by refusing to meet with Mr. Tony. So, in response, he issued a decree for the Phantoms to find Satan sidekicks and steal their vests whenever possible. This led to a number of increasingly violent incidents, including an attempted robbery at a gas station where two phantom members named Christopher Odom and Old Burger allegedly beat a sidekick's member so badly that his head swelled up like a pumpkin. God damn. Then there was an incident at a party thrown by the Hell Lovers, ironically intended to ease tensions between hobbyist and outlaw motorcycle clubs in the area. The phantoms crashed the party, dragged a Satan sidekick into a back room, and with guns drawn formed a line, blocking Hell Lovers away from the back area, while multiple phantoms beat the sidekick to a pulp. Sheesh. The phantoms were never afraid to throw their weight around. And just one year prior, in October 2012, a Michigan phantom had shot and wounded two Zulus motorcycle club members at a party in Columbus, Ohio. Now, once again, things were quickly escalating to the point where lethal violence would come into play. Then, on September 8th and 9th, 2013, a group of phantoms set out to the clubhouse of- If this is the clubhouse, if this is the hangout spot, the let out spot, boy, you know it really get cracking, dog. And I only say that while bracking, cracking, you feel me, however y'all wanna put it. But I only say that because just look at this little area, you know, you know. If you ain't from this side, don't be on this side. And don't don't come here on um at night, bro. Like I don't know. I don't even I don't know. But right now it looks hella empty. I don't know the time of taking this. Ooh, like you know, I don't know. But of a motorcycle club called the Soul Devils. I'm just basically trying to say that. Broad daylight and then hella empty. I would assume they'll be packed. hopeful that they'd find a Satan sidekick there. The large group included Miller, who would later paint himself out to be a hapless bystander, but who other club members would later accuse of basically organizing the entire thing. Others there included Roger Valdez, aka June, and PC, the man Miller had been caught stealing a motorcycle with in the previous May. At any rate, in the early morning of September 9th, the group spotted a sidekick's member named Leon McGee exiting the clubhouse with his wife. It just so happened that June had exited Miller's truck to urinate when McGee exited, and he promptly ran up to McGee and threw a punch at his head. The much bigger McGee barely reacted to the blow, but soon the entire group of sidekicks jumped on McGee and began pummeling him while his wife screamed at them a few feet away. McGee's wife carried a machete, and McGee yelled at her to, quote, grab that. But when he did, Miller interpreted the remark as McGee asking his wife to reach for a firearm. Miller began to yell, gun, gun, and his fellow phantoms responded. PC and June drew their own guns, and McGee pulled out his own knife and began to slash. In the fracas that ensued, PC was stabbed in the stomach, 
and McGee was shot. Bullets hit him in the face and forearm, and he fell back into his truck while his wife took the wheel and peeled out towards the nearest trauma center. Meanwhile, the Phantoms began to look after their own wounded comrade and headed off to the very same hospital, where PC Ah. would end up admitted just a few doors down from where McGee was being treated. While McGee's wounds were serious... We do all this just to end up in the same place, bro. Like all this shit took took place on uh, all right. All this took place somewhere in the street, and then to get patched to get patched up, right? Get patched up, get get uh, stitches and all that case, whatever. The whole nine health, um, you know the uh, healthcare uh, route. Just to end up in the same hospital, bro. So what does that mean? So when you guys end up in the same hospital after doing all that shit to each other outside on the street, do y'all do it again? In the hospital, or do you just like, hey, you know what? Give me about like a month or so when I'm here. When this, I, I, I got gotcha. He somehow survived. PC made it through the night as well, but soon everyone would blame Miller for how things went down. June would later describe how he showed up late to a phantoms meeting, where Mr. Tony was absolutely laying into Miller for the plan going awry. Miller was scrambling to defend himself. And when he saw June, he almost reflexively started pointing fingers, telling Tony that June had, quote, jumped the gun by punching McGee before the others were ready. June spoke up. You know what, man? I shot the dude. I shot the dude in the face, he said, though he'd later claim that he'd actually fired in the air, and that was PC who shot McGee. For his part, McGee would later identify PC from a police photo lineup as the man who shot him. Miller wasn't done facing the music, either. Before the Phantoms yelled at him, he had to hear about it from the ATF. Marsh blamed him for allowing the situation to get out of hand and endangering lives, then informed Miller the feds had come up with a solution. They outfitted him with a GPS tracking device and instructed him to inform the Phantoms that he'd been ordered to wear one by a judge in his motorcycle theft prosecution, and that if he was ever invited to go rob sidekicks for their vests again, he was to use his new ankle monitor as an excuse to avoid it. Ah. A little less than three weeks later, tragedy struck. Phantom members Stephen Shoeboots Caldwell and Andre He-Man Swift were riding motorcycles through Detroit when a Chevy Tahoe pulled alongside them and at least one shooter, probably two, opened fire from behind. Swift was injured, but the bullet that struck Caldwell went through his back, into his abdomen, striking internal organs, and killing him. It was an enormous blow to the Phantoms, who lost one of their most beloved members and were enraged that the killers had snuck up on them and shot them in the back. Out of everyone, the shooting was perhaps most devastating to Mr. Tony, who was a lifelong friend of Shoe Boots and viewed him as a baby brother. In a call to Carl Miller just hours after the shooting, while Caldwell was still on life support, Tony confided in Miller that he was beside himself with grief. Later, when Caldwell passed away, the two spoke on the phone again, tears streaming down his face as he lamented in a rare moment of vulnerability. We bleed too. Miller consoled his friend, telling Tony, You know, no matter what, I do love you, bro. I love you too, Tony replied. Meanwhile, on the other side of the line, Miller had been recording everything with the device given to him by the ATF. In his moment of grief, Tony continued to talk. Just woke up a giant, he said, referring to Shoeboot's killers. Then he added, I need ten of them, bro, and it still won't be enough for me. You know what I'm saying? But according to the ATF, this wasn't just talk. Within a matter of days, Mr. Tony, Chosen One, and a host of other phantoms started laying down the groundwork for a mass murder retaliation plot. Through his own investigation and ties with the Vice Lords, Tony had determined that it was not the Satan sidekicks, as everyone assumed, but the Hell Lovers who had killed Shoe Boots. Rather than strike back immediately, they decided to wait until after Shoe Boots' funeral, knowing that the memorial service would be a time and place where the Phantoms would be extremely vulnerable to possible violent retaliation if they were to kill a Hell Lover's member beforehand. But that precaution gave them an idea. 
Soon, a plan was hatched to kill two to three Hell Lovers in ambush-style attacks, then God. arm themselves in preparation for the funeral, where they would wait for Hell Lovers to gather and then go at them a second time in the hopes of killing any number of people who showed up to mourn the fallen members. After that, there was even talk of traveling across state lines to Tennessee and killing Hell Lovers across the country. Miller learned of... Bro, they go. They willing to go that far. Bro, that is just some next level. <sighs> the plot. And while his ankle monitor restricted the number of phantoms meetings he could now attend, he had other attendees to tell him what had occurred, recording as they spoke. After noting that several members appeared to be stockpiling weapons, discussing specific addresses of Hell Lover's members to kill, and that one had secured a stolen van to possibly use in a shooting, the ATF moved in with the October 4th, 2013 raids across Michigan, rounding up Mr. Tony, Chosen One, PC, June, Christopher Odom, Mo Williams, and a grand total of 14 Phantoms members, charged with racketeering crimes ranging from weapons violations to the alleged murder plot. Before long, Mo Williams, June, and Phantom member Vicente Ghost Phillips took plea deals and agreed to testify, joining Miller on the witness stand for the trial of Chosen One, Mr. Tony, PC, Sherman Brown, Matthew Arsenal Shamit, Brian Jackson, and Charles Davis. All were charged with murder conspiracy, save Arsenal, who was solely accused of living up to his nickname by stockpiling firearms for the Phantoms. The group went to trial in 2015, and Miller spent more than a week on the stand, playing his secret recordings for the judge and jury, while men he'd professed to love sat a few feet away from the defendant's chair. To the defense attorneys, this was a classic example of a manufactured case, where Miller had not only elicited statements from people who were grieving a loved one and probably didn't mean what they were saying, but who'd set the events of September 8th and 9th into motion so that the ATF could have a violent act to throw at the Phantoms in court. Defense attorney Michael Radich, rife with sports analogies, said the alleged plot to rob sidekicks for their vests was nothing more than a little roughhousing between clubs, akin to football fans having a fist fight in the stands of a game, then making up later. And he'd argue that even if the crimes were proven, the defendants couldn't be guilty of racketeering, because one of the requirements was to prove the Phantoms were a criminal organization, which they weren't. He argued, Four out of five might be a good day for Miguel Cabrera at the plate, but four out of five doesn't cut it in terms of the government getting a conviction against these defendants. But the prosecution countered with a notebook seized during the investigation which contained a set of rules for the Phantoms Motorcycle Club. It left little doubt to what side of the law the Phantoms saw themselves on. Quote, Phantoms are an outlaw motorcycle club, period. Phantoms will remain as an outlaw motorcycle club at all times. At the trial's end, while the jury was technically split, they leaned heavily against the Phantoms. Everyone was convicted, except for Charles Davis, who, ironically, was the only defendant who had a prior homicide conviction for killing a neighborhood bully when he was just 16 years old. Davis had made allegedly incriminating statements while under the influence of prescribed medication at Shuboot's funeral, and had never followed up on his offer to supply the Phantoms with Uzis. All that was left now was for U.S. District Judge Paul Borman to pronounce the sentence. Typically in this situation, defendants are encouraged to show remorse, as that can sway judges a great deal toward... I was about to say, damn. Not the outlaw shouted. Shouted, 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 shouted. It's leniency, especially in cases like this where no one was killed. By and large, the Phantoms didn't do that, and they stuck by their contention that this was a manufactured case brought about by a desperate turncoat but their refusal probably added years to their prison terms. With prosecutors reminding Borman he'd fired during the ATF raid, Chosen One was given 40 years in federal prison. Mr. Tony was given 35. Shh. Brian P.C. Sorrell was sentenced to 21 years for shooting Leon McGee. 
and the remainder were given prison terms approaching a decade. Out of all those who took their case to trial, perhaps no one better articulated their predicament better than Brian Jackson, who stood in court and recounted all he'd done for the community. At 48, he'd spent his life literally building Detroit as a construction worker, claimed he never engaged in violence, and was convicted of conspiracy for telling Miller, his chapter president, what went on in a meeting where Mr. Tony had outlined the murder plot. He wasn't just the government's confidential informant. He was the president of Detroit. When he come in and asked me what he said at the meeting, I told the man. I didn't add nothing to it, and I didn't take anything away from it. I gave the man what was said at the meeting, and here I am. Judge Borman sentenced him to eight years. Hmm. That's not bad compared to what everybody else got, I guess. But all right, man, I'm going to catch you on the next one. I hope y'all were fucking with it. If not, hit that like and hit that comment and subscribe. I'm going to get at y'all. One.